uh, on time. So I'm, I want to start by introducing and thanking Dr. Bernard, uh, who is a senior oncologist and very uh, not only a, very, a veteran oncologist, but a, the, one of those unique oncologists who put patients first. Um, we have tight uh, relationship. I know him for a while and always enjoyed our interaction. So he gratefully agreed to join us this morning and help patients understand a little bit more about the relationship with, between the coronavirus uh, and cancer patient. How does it impact our day-to-day? -day? What should we be aware of? And what does it mean for us in terms of treatment plans? Um, so he will share our, his thought, his view, his know-how, and then we'll open it up for questions as he will be happy to advise and help everyone Get a, be a little bit more knowledgeable on how to deal with this epidemia. So, Dr. Bernard, the, the, the stage is all yours. Okay. Well, good to talk to you guys this morning. I know this is a difficult time for most of us, and cancer in itself presents its own unique challenges, and then when you have a pandemic like this, it changes a lot of things in the way we normally do things. So, the first question is, you know, what do we know about cancer and this COVID-19 virus? All our information actually we have currently comes from China. And a couple of things to note is that this was mainly looking at people who are hospitalized in China. So basically anybody who was in a hospital bed was looked at. And if you looked at the overall numbers they provided us, there was a very small percentage of cancer patients. And I think that is rather interesting because we think that you know cancer patients are immunocompromised in many ways, be it from their cancer or be it from the treatments they're getting. So why did they register at as a relatively small number in patients being admitted to the hospital? What I suspect is, and if you see, what we are teaching all our patients to avoid during COVID-19 outbreak is something we teach all our cancer patients. We teach every patient to wash your hands, stay away from sick people, stay away from crowds. You know, we've actually done practice social distancing quite a bit ourselves, well before COVID-19, and I suspect we will continue to do so after COVID-19. So what we do is actually quite effective if you use the Chinese numbers to look for an explanation unless the Chinese miscalculated. But I think the strategy of social distancing, and remember now, six feet is not a maximum, it's a minimum. and I think also washing your hands, staying, making sure even family members who don't need to be seeing you, especially if they are sick, not to come anywhere near you is really very important. One big difference though, what we have to learn, and I think it's very important for all of you guys to think about, and including the rest of us too, not, it's just not for cancer patients, it's for everybody, is the biggest problem we are having is healthy people who are infected with COVID-19 viruses who look perfectly normal, but who are infecting other people. So even though somebody affects or looks perfectly fine, they could still be carrying the virus, and I think we need to be very careful with that. And what do I mean by that? I mean, somebody in your family or anybody else could meet you and look perfectly healthy, but still infect you. So what I'm pleading to younger people as well, even though I know they feel invincible most of the time, but if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for your family members and loved ones that you don't pick up something and give it to somebody else. So it's a little bit of doing it for yourself, but also doing it for other people. And I think that's the big difference now that we're seeing is a lot of the infections we are probably seeing are not being distributed by people who appear sick, except in hospital settings and things like that, but more in people who are healthy appearing, but appear to be carrying the virus around. So with that, I think, you know, if we can practice what we've always learned of, you know, avoiding crowds, washing your hands, etc. But also people who you don't really have to meet, I would say avoid them as much as possible. If you look at the new guidelines, they're being slowly transformed right across the plane. In the beginning, they were telling people not to wear masks, etc. unless somebody appears ill. But they're slowly starting to change the tune in that. And if you look at the places that have been rather successful in handling this pandemic, you know, in South Korea and all that, regular use of masks have always been there. So if you have to go out, especially since you're immunocompromised, I would suggest you wear a mask. Now, I've said a bit, so I'll open it up for what people would like to 
ask questions this time, Zoya, do you want to? I can't hear you, Zoya. Uh, so I'll, I'll kick it off by asking you something that we hear a lot from patients lately. Patients mm -hmm. are very anxious as they see their treatment being postponed um, and they see direct impact on their treatment plan, surgery being postponed, uh, clinical trials, not accepting any patients. What are the guidelines and what is the thought on that and what is the risk for a patient? Well, first, there are no more guidelines. And before, the way oncology operated was we tried to make everything same for everybody across the board. But now it's going towards more customization than anything else. And sorry, need to turn that off. Um, customization rather than thinking we need to do the same thing for everybody. And what do I mean by that? I think part of it is risk-benefit ratio. And it depends on which part of the country you live in. For example, New York has been pretty badly hit and the hospitals are getting overwhelmed, but that's not the case in certain other states. So the guidelines are going to be sort of a little different depending on each group and also depending on your situation. For example, a breast cancer patient, you know, depends if they are non-invasive breast cancer patient and all they have is a uh, hormone receptor pass to breast cancer, then potentially just being on an anti-estrogen therapy would be able to buy it some time. But if you're a triple negative breast cancer and really you've finished your neoadjuvant therapy, then it's gonna be important for you to get your surgery. Maybe you do not get reconstruction at the same time, but a lot of places are performing their surgeries because it's, they're just trying to kind of lay out what the risk benefit for each patient is. So each subset is going to be a slightly different in terms of what their care is. So I think they need to very closely talk to their providers. And you know, if it doesn't sound right, chances are it's not right. But some people, even hospitals are operating out of fear, right? So because this has been such an unprecedented thing, but cancer patients have been living with fear for a long time and they're the bravest people I know as far as I'm concerned. So I think you always need to say, sure, this is what you're doing for everybody be an advocate for yourself. And I think this is really important for every cancer patient to know. You have to advocate for yourself and reach out beyond that primary circle if that's the case. And I think that becomes, don't take no for an answer too easily because the common answer being handed out right now is this is what we've decided. I think you need to be a little bit more precise. Okay, uh, this is my situation. How does it fit into the scheme of everybody else's? So don't just readily just take no for an answer because you guys are smart people. We've taught you guys what to look for and what not to look for. We can't suddenly change the rules without giving you the right explanation. Do not accept an explanation as this is what our hospital policy is. Talk to your medical oncologist, talk to your surgical oncologist, talk to your radiation oncologist. And if I were you, I'd talk to them each separately because you can also compare to see what each one is saying. We understand certain things are being done by rote, but that need not happen anymore. Agreed. Makes a lot of sense. Aline, I see you want to ask something. Okay, so Aline needs a few more minutes. Um, another question that I've heard a lot is because some of the side effects of treatment for those who are in it, some of the immunotherapy and some of the chemo could be flu-like symptom or similar to COVID symptom. How do I know if it's a side effect of my treatment anymore or how do I know if I should be worried about being infected? Is there okay. any way of me to diff? Yeah. Well, it's hard to be very precise, but I always say either way you have to be evaluated, right? Because if you're under active treatment, it's not like you're not being actively treated. Whether you be on immunotherapy or chemotherapy, a lot of these symptoms are very similar to COVID type symptoms. The difference though is if you've been getting chemotherapy, you could be neutropenic. So if you're running a fever, you can't just assume, well, it could be from COVID symptoms. You could, on the other hand, be neutropenic as well. So you still have to be evaluated. Different hospitals are setting up different protocols for this, depending on where you're located. For example, in our urgent care, we get triaged automatically by our nurse practitioner who very much specializes in oncology. So unless there's a high index of suspicion that you could infect other people, most of these patients are still being evaluated in our urgent care. 
in terms of what has to happen or what cannot happen. Fair enough, thank you very much. Olivia, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, um, so you had mentioned that, you know, it's encouraged to wear masks and gloves outside of, outside of the house, but what about while I'm inside the house? Um, would you encourage, you know, more like for, uh, you know, whether it's patients or caregivers to wear masks and gloves? Well, what I would tell you is, if you're at home, it depends on who's at home with you. Are they isolating with you? Are they being responsible with you? Because I think it's very important. This is truly teamwork now. It cannot be like, this is the patient and this is a spouse or these are the kids. The rules need to be across the board. For example, taking kids out of school wasn't done on a whim. We don't want the kids to go out somewhere into school and bring something back. So I think it'll be very irresponsible for families, especially when you have an immunocompromised person at home, to send the kids out to other activities and then bring them back home. Because you just don't know how many people are going to be transmitting these things. So I would say, you know, as long as you know where your circle very firmly is, that's one thing. But if you don't, or you have a teenager who insists on going out and coming back, you see what I mean? That changes the dynamic of everything. So it's kind of, I think this is when you get your whole family together and form your team and make sure everybody understands. I think kids only think about themselves because they're not told any different. But I think mm -hmm. kids and spouses or family members need to understand that, hey, you know, your actions no longer affect only you, right? I think you need to have that talk first. And that is as important as protecting yourself as your family bringing something back to you. You see what I mean? So I think that's really more important than worrying about who wears a mask or who doesn't. Because if somebody is in an apartment-like situation, you can do anything you want, but it's very hard not to cross-contaminate, right? So I think you're trying to cut off the source for that in its entirety right off the top by meeting with your family and, you know, making sure they understand it's serious. I think sometimes people don't believe it. And if they don't, you know, you can set up a telephone meeting with somebody else that you know, not, it's not the patient complaining. Usually patients never complain about anything. So, but this is really important where don't look at it as a complaint. Look at it as information and we really need to educate our families for this. Thank you. Aline, would you like to ask something? Yeah, sorry about the, the other moment. So um, for uh, uh, breast cancer, uh, early stages, uh, at the last part of, after surgery and the last part of radiation, Mm -hmm. So do I need to, um, 16 radiations plus five boosts, do I need to hold the, the last uh, radiations or, or, or what should I do? Stay at home and then do it in two months? Well, I think that's probably not a good, since you're in the middle of radiation, I would complete it. Okay, because you're not going, the way radiation works is it's the, they're trying to give you the least amount of radiation for the most amount of effect. So it's not like they added in you know, additional radiation treatments to do later. So to get the most out of it, I would, this is how I would approach it. I would commit to wanting to get it under certain circumstances. And the circumstances are fairly straightforward, meaning what are you doing to protect me when I'm coming in? How short will my visit have to be? What kind of protective, see, because we need to know what the other side is doing to you. You can try to protect yourself but if the institution you're going to is a little bit cavalier about it at any level, that's problematic, right? And I think most institutions are being very, very, very good about this right now. And since radiation is a relatively short treatment, I would talk to my radiation oncologist about finishing up what you got and maybe do the boost later, but that would depend on your radiation oncologist. And how long after the radiation uh, is, is the body considered to be more vulnerable? Well, radiation, basically, did you get any other form of therapy before your radiation, chemotherapy? Just anything like that? Surgery. Just surgery and radiation. So you had a lumpectomy and radiation. So the reality of it is the total amount of immunocompromise you should have shouldn't be great, okay? Because you've not received any kind of systemic therapy. And when people try to radiate the breast, they use tangential fields to make sure they don't affect your marrow much. So as long as you're constant drop and all that, you're going to be near normal, but not normal, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's what we, we are, all, right? <laughs> near normal. <laughs> yeah. We have another breast cancer uh, patient question. Yael, would you like to ask? 
You're on mute, my dear. Just a second. I'm unmuting you. Start over. Yeah. Hi, doctor. Hey. Uh, I have a question. Um, how can I trust uh, my, my doctor that they are saying that the gap between the last chemo to surgery, lumpectomy or mastectomy, uh, it's no different. It, it's usually between three, four, five weeks after the last chemo. Mm -hmm. And now with all the uh, pandemic and everything, they are postponing my surgery and saying that I can stay without uh, treatment, without uh, any treatment without surgery, we are around eight weeks, nine weeks, and they don't know when the, the pandemic will stop. They don't know where, when will be the peak or when they will start to operate. And you, I, I'm in between. I don't know what to do. Well, so when did you finish your chemotherapy? March 12th. March 12th, okay. So you do have and seven we weeks. So you do have a couple more weeks under which we would normally, you know, get you in for surgery under normal circumstances. Can I ask you a couple yeah. questions about, about your cancer itself? Were you hormone receptor positive? Yeah. What was your... The, the, uh, estrogen, the estrogen is close, the pro progesterone is uh, 5%. But what is the estrogen? Do you remember? No, it's via. Uh, I don't remember. It was me, it was, I don't remember the levels, I apologize. But it's Not about... The, 20, 30, something like that? Something, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, well... The PR was low, the PR was okay. Okay, so the whole thing is that as long as one of them are reasonably positive, anti-estrogen therapy, we say anti-estrogen therapy, but the people are only progesterone receptor positive to do the spot. Mm -hmm. So what I would recommend, because everything, if you live in New York, your risk for surgery is pretty high, okay? So, and that's what they're really trying to protect you from. But two things. And I think this is where, you know, you have to always go ahead and for yourself, you have to keep pushing your agenda because people are so overwhelmed, they're using standard answers for everybody, right? So in your case, what I would tell you is mm -hmm. start your anti-estrogen therapy, all right? The second thing is what you could do is okay. have them, how much did your tumor shrink? Do you know that? Did they image you? No. No, so, we know it, they, they, did an, they did an MRI. They, it's possible shrink. Uh, I, I, had also, I have also in the lymph node, the, but they didn't give me the number of uh, percentage that they shrink. Okay, so, because that would be really important for you to push them and ask them, how much shrinkage did I have, right? Because if you don't have much shrinkage, it's a different paradigm altogether, right? So, but yeah. if you have a significant... And I think what you need to ask them is, ask them concrete numbers. Did it shrink by 25%, 50%, 75%? Just ask the question concretely. So okay. that way they don't dance around it. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And if it still have, uh, it shrink, the leaf not shrink uh, a little bit and still there, but in this time, it's still linked to the body. You know, it's, we don't know if the, the microcells start to spread or start to... Correct, but that's the whole thing. So if you with say the, that it shrunk very little, right, then I would advocate pushing to proceed okay. with surgery because it hasn't shrunk enough. And if it shrank, so it all depends on the number you end up getting from them. And I would push them for a number because if it is not shrinking much, your, the risk to you is fairly high and maybe the place you're going to can recommend where else you can go to potentially get your same procedure if they are not hit so bad by the virus. You see what I mean? But if you are not shrinking, you need to really push mm -hmm. them and say that you, but if they're telling you it's shrinking significantly. I barely hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, can, I'll share it with you after the, the recording, Yeah. So, yeah, we, we, okay, I, I can barely hear you. The short answer, it, yeah. get the number that they tell you it has shrunk by or not shrunk by, and then proceed from there. Fair enough. Uh, another question okay. that I just- Thank you so much. You're welcome. Another question I just received, uh, Dr. Bernard, people are on immunotherapy. Are, are they also considered that their immune system is compromised or their immune system is actually in a hyper, so it should be better ready to fight also coronavirus? Um, the reality of it is, you know, we're not sure. We know anybody with cancer to some extent is considered immunocompromised. Because if you think about the way immunotherapy works, 
all our immune system is normally working at about 20%. So when you give somebody immunotherapy, you're trying to dial up that immunotherapy to about 70%. But two potential, and I can't give you any proof for this, is this is more logic driven. It's if your immune system is driven up significantly, it can be a good thing or a bad thing. And for example, when this virus is attacking people, right? The reason they get into trouble and on a ventilator is there's so much inflammation from, from an immune mediated reaction, okay? So if your immune system is already revved up, you may want to be careful because that could potentially give you, then it's just like you said earlier, Zria, there's no saying if it's related to your therapy or if it's from the virus. So that actually makes it more complicated because the symptoms from immunotherapy too can be quite significant on your lungs in terms of toxicity. So you have to kind of walk that line rather closely and don't assume that the immunotherapy will protect you from the virus. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Will, I see that you want to ask a question. Yeah, um, I'm curious about uh, the the length at which the time at which you've been diagnosed for cancer and and how whether or not you're more or less um, vulnerable. So if it's if you've just been diagnosed versus like you know you're a couple years out versus ten years out is like. How does that that uh, differ, your well, vulnerability? In terms of if you're already cured from your cancer and about 10 years out, I mean, that's going to be as close to near normal as possible, right? Because your immune system should have got back most of its things, its ability to fight off things in that period of time. But this is what I tell patients routinely, even before COVID virus, right? You know, every year that goes by, things keep improving. So the further you're away from your incidents, it is proportionately better. Thank you. Fair enough. That's good. Does anyone have any additional question they want to ask? Um, can I? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, are there any? Is there anything that I should take uh, during this period? To, you know, supplements or other medicines as preventative, just to kind of make sure that I'm more protected. You know, there anything is, from, yeah. There is no specific protections for this. In fact, I tell you to be careful about taking things because almost everything we give people like this have its own sets of issues. So then you're not going to know what's coming from a new supplement you're potentially taking to something else, but there's nothing out there that's proven to help us. Thank you. And to determine a lot in terms of how the whole country is going. So I'd say in the short term, try not to do it if possible. Okay. And you have to do it. You know, I would, you know, practice all the safety measures we talked about earlier. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Does anybody have any additional question before we let uh, Dr. Bernard back to his clinic that he's trying to keep us alive and, and working as, and functioning during these days? If not, then feel free to reach out to us with an additional question. We will pass it to him and we'll give an answer. And we'll, we, we, we might do it again uh, in the coming weeks um, with Dr. Bernard will be willing to give donate again from his precious time. And I really, really appreciate uh, everybody's time today and joining us today, and especially you, Dr. Bernard. Thank you so oh, much well, you for your help and guidance to the community. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Stay healthy, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, everyone.